Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you offered the only sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. Make us to be attentive to your word so that we wouldn't trust in ourselves but on what you have accomplished on the cross, so that we would not try to merit our salvation but know that it is a free gift that you give to us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, made holy by his offering on the cross. Grace and peace be yours. Amen. The theme for this sermon will be Jesus, your great high priest, us, priests of Christ for the world, based on the reading of the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 10, verses 11 to 14 and verse 18. The first two verses of our text make a comparison between the service of Jewish priests at the tabernacle or the temple and the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross. It must be said that the religion of the Old Testament that God himself established is a religion of sacrifice. First, there were the sacrifices that took place at the tabernacle, the tent where God dwelled among his people. Next, there were sacrifices that continued at the temple after its dedication, throughout the reign of Solomon, up until the time that Jerusalem fell at the hands of the Babylonians in 586 BC. Then there was a period of time without sacrifices. And then in about 516 before Jesus was born, it was brought in the construction of the second temple. And that temple, although it was modernized by Herod the Great, um, was finally destroyed in 70 AD, about 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, it seems that the letter to the Hebrews had been written before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD because its author talks about the sacrifices at the temple as if they were regularly going on. So I want you to think about this for a moment especially for the reality of Christian Jews. They went to the temple to pray to God. But as for the sacrifices that were going on there, they understood that they were superfluous, that they were offensive to God because Jesus had already paid for the sins of the world. It makes sense to us that God allowed the temple to be destroyed and hasn't let it be rebuilt because Jesus offered the sacrifice for us all. And yet these Jewish priests continued to offer sacrifices uselessly, without end, according to the requirements of the law. Like a rat in a wheel, the priests continued following the requirements of the law. But they never made it any further. The sacrifices of the Jewish priests were unable to take away sins. Because Jesus came and had already taken away their sin. The law had been satisfied. There was nothing left to accomplish to earn forgiveness. Jesus was the sacrifice without sin. And he offered himself as the Lamb of God without blemish or fault. For Jesus, his sacrifice was acceptable to his father. And the death of this innocent man, Jesus, put an end to the necessity for any other sacrifice. Thus we read in our text, where there is the forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any need to present an offering for sin. Now think about it. Imagine you took out a mortgage to buy a house. It was a huge sum. And you're working to try and pay off that debt. You have something automatically coming out of your bank account every month. And you go over and above. And at the end of every month, you look at what you have. And any money that you were able to squirrel away, you throw that onto your mortgage. You stop even looking at the bank statements because you know that you're nowhere near being able to pay off 
the mortgage. But somebody comes, someone who loves you greatly, who has the money, and takes care of it. You owe nothing more. But because you're not paying attention, you're continuing doing what you were doing. So every month, you're set, the, the bank account is sending this money over to the bank, and they're putting it back. And you try and make extra payments, and they won't accept them. You finally go and talk to the branch manager, and you say, look, I'm trying to pay my mortgage. You guys aren't accepting what I owe you. And the manager says, well, you don't owe us anything. It's already taken care of. But you refuse to believe that. So much so that you just start leaving cash on the desk at the branch. How can we get you to understand that you don't owe anything? Well, that was the situations of these Jewish priests who were continuing to offer sacrifices, refusing to believe that the sacrifice of Jesus had taken away sin. But you see, here's the thing. It's not just a problem that was for the Jewish priests who thought this way. All religion, apart from the Christian faith, is the religion of the law. And the people who believe those religions want to pay their debt. They want to make themselves acceptable to God. Let me ask you, how many Christians think the same way? What do I have to do to get ready and right with God? Despite the teaching that Christ has done everything to pay for their sins, many Christians think that their salvation depends on themselves. They want to work their way up. They want to climb. They want to make a pilgrim's progress to get salvation whether it's by mystic religiosity, they want to meet God in their own heart, or if they think that it's by their own morality, by how good a person they are, they can make themselves acceptable to God. If only I could do more and better. They think that by rationalism, if I could understand God more, if I know him, well then that will be enough to be a source of salvation for me. Some people think that being prosperous is proof that God has blessed you. Some think that if you just keep doing religious practices, if you pray enough, if you um, attend enough services, if you do enough X, Y, or Z, they think that's enough. And some will even go so far as to say, I'm just going to reject the law. And by doing that, they become slaves to sin. But Christianity doesn't reject the law of God. It just rejects the proposition that man can obey the law and can save himself by that obedience. The only source of salvation is Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, which puts an end to all human efforts. In verse 14, we read, where there's the forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering, any sacrifice to be presented for sin. That's why our text speaks in the language of the ascension of Jesus, by saying that he seated himself at the right hand of the Father. Jesus no longer had to offer sacrifices. Jesus is not only a priest, but a royal priest, before whom all of his enemies have become his footstool. They've become subject to him. Now, tomorrow is going to be the Remembrance Day celebration. And that remembers putting an end to the First World War. The reign of Jesus isn't established by the defeat of a worldly army. Rather, Jesus' victory is a liturgical offering, a liturgical work, a sacrifice. So I ask you, confession and absolution, when you come to church, doesn't it seem like they're a little bit like the sacrifices of the Jewish priests of repetition week after week? You keep announcing that you're a sinner and the pastor keeps telling you that you're forgiven. And yet you continue to be a, a, a sinner. No, it's not like those Jewish sacrifices. 
You see, you come and you confess your sins, and I, as a pastor, absolve you. You are forgiven. That said, confession isn't a work you do to earn forgiveness. And the absolution that I announce isn't based on some new sacrifice that I present on your behalf. It's always based on that single solitary sacrifice of Jesus dying on the cross for your sin. Jesus sends his his messengers to announce this good news. And on the basis of this, to proclaim the grace of Jesus. You are forgiven. Believe it. In verse 14, our text says, by a single offering, he brings to perfection forever those that he makes holy. Jesus is the source of holiness. Perfection, in our text, isn't just a passing reality. Oh, you're perfect for a time, but then you're not anymore. It's not that you're perfect after you've confessed your sins, until you've gone and committed other ones. No. Jesus has sanctified you. But it's an ongoing reality. So you confess your sins because that's true. You are a sinner. And I announce to you forgiveness because you are sinners who have been forgiven in Christ. And you need to hear this word that you are forgiven, so that you would put your trust in this word. A number of years ago, there was an ad for a soap company. And a man was going about his daily life, doing all of his activities. Uh, First off, he would start in the shower, but then he'd be going to breakfast, and then he'd be going to work. And the whole time, he was getting drenched with water. It never stopped. It just kept flowing. And this soap wanted to communicate by this that by using their product, it was like you were continually being cleansed. Dear saints, you participate in the holiness of God and you continue to receive this holiness. It says it's not enough that God sent Jesus as a great high priest but he works through his holy ministry to forgive sinners. He's continuing to do that work based on the sacrifice of Christ. That said, it's not only to pastors that Jesus has given the right to announce forgiveness. He gives that to the church, to you. In 1 Peter 2.9, we hear that you are a royal priesthood to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That is to say, you are to speak words of forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness, when somebody commits a sin against you. It is up to you to comfort the person who has a bad conscience, who recognizes that they've done wrong, to reassure them to the fact that Jesus has died for his sin. In the Gospels, when Jesus heals the paralyzed man, the one whose friends set him down through the roof, the Pharisees asked the question, who can forgive sins but God alone? Because Jesus forgave that man's sin. And yes, Jesus is God, and he could forgive the paralyzed man. But Jesus was also a man. And Matthew in talking about this text, says, when the crowd saw this, they were amazed and celebrated the glory of God that God gave such power to men. Yes, God has given to men, to you, to me, the power to forgive. It's not our own power, but it's his power. Luther preached All Christians who've been baptized have this power. In the same way, they praise Christ and their words are given to them so that they can say whenever, however often, and whenever necessary, look, dear man, 
God offers you his grace, and he forgives you all of your sins. Be comforted. Your sins have been forgiven. Rejoice and take comfort in this. Have this consolation. Believe it. It's yours. And that's when you say, or that's when I say to you, your sins have been forgiven. Believe it. As sure as if it was God himself that said to you, you're forgiven. God has given men the authority to forgive sins. And this, this causes the kingdom of Christ to grow. It offers comfort and a reassurance to a troubled conscience. We do this by the word. May God cause us to grasp this. End of citation from Luther. Dear saints, you have in Jesus Christ a great high priest who has forgiven you. Where there's the forgiveness of sins, there's no longer any offering to be presented for sin. But for you, a sole offering, a single offering, has been made. And it continues to drive to perfection those that he makes holy. And it's an ongoing work of God in you. And such that you as saints, as a royal priesthood, you announce the sacrifice of Christ, you announce forgiveness to the world. People can say, who can forgive sins but God alone? But God has given such a power to men. Marvel and celebrate the glory of God. You are forgiven. And you are called to announce Christ's forgiveness. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds steadfast in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>